feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. We come to you virtually from not only Seattle today, we're down in the Bay Area and up way north in Alaska. More on that in a minute. If you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, this right here is the podcast for you, the podcast of record. It's where we say street smarts and book smarts collide. Hello again, everyone. I'm Dan Whedon. My co-host today is Linda Popke. We are excited to have as our guest a friend of both of ours, Christian Muntean. Christian has helped hundreds of businesses rapidly grow, increase profitability, and expand impact. He works with entrepreneurial business leaders who are scaling their businesses or, very importantly, preparing for exit or succession. Christian is the author of the book called The Successful New CEO, and Conflict Leadership is another book. He's a frequent guest on podcasts. Now he's going to be on his new favorite podcast. He's also a regular contributor to Forbes. Christian lives in Anchorage, Alaska with his, with his wife and three active children. I didn't know any children weren't active. He enjoys woodworking and practices Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We're going to have to talk about that. Christian, welcome. We'll be with you in a minute. Everyone, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We're on iHeartRadio. Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube. Linda, what are we? We are ubiquitous. Of course we are. Come to you from about a dozen cities, including the mothership in Atlanta. Before we bring on Christian. Hello there, Linda. Hi. How are you How doing? Are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm I'm doing well. I, you can't tell, but the sun it's cold, but the sun is out today here in the beautiful uh, Puget Sound. It's cold here, and um, I don't know. I, I hopefully the flooding has stopped in the Bay Area. Yeah, it's it's dry right now. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Linda, I have a special edition banter. I, it, it's kind of it's not really a plead the fifth, but I got a question for you, and I'm asking you this question because I have an answer to my own question. That's how I roll with these things. Uh, okay. Linda, curious, is there something really cool, an activity, an event, something unique that you have done once? that you can't imagine that you're ever going to have a chance to do again. Do you have something like that? Oh, boy. God, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, one thing I did, I got to check, I got to play Billy Joel's concert grand piano. Wait a second, uh, what? Say I, that again. I got to play Billy Joel's concert grand piano at the Steinway Hall in New York City. It was kind of marked to the side, and we were playing a number of pianos, and it said Joel. It was like, Joel who? Billy Joel. Joel. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'll get to do that again. But um, I he wasn't sitting there next that. to you, was he? No, he wasn't. I think he might have not have let me put my hands on it had he been there. But. And by the way, was there a sign that says do not touch there? No. No. Okay. No, they so, yeah. Well, you you know, I, I thought of this because uh, Christian is our guest and he's coming to us from Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, my very first trip to Anchorage, Alaska was in October of 1988. It's very specific in my mind. I, I was an underwriter at United Pacific Insurance, and, and Alaska was my, my, one of my territory. I got a chance to go up and visit a, uh, an agent. And this agent said to me, she said, I, one of my clients is a dog sledder. She's in the Iditarod regularly. Um, she, she'd be probably happy to take you on a dog sled ride. Would you like that? And I said, are you kidding me? Of course I'd like that. I mean, I was like 24 years old. I was really excited for that. And, uh, so I go up there and we had to fly from Anchorage to Homer, Alaska, which was the scariest plane trip I've ever taken in my life. Uh, I, I'll just say that. And that night before the, the dog sledding, uh, I was in a, in a bar in Homer, Alaska and watched Kirk Gibson hit that uh, home for the LA Dodgers hit the home run in the World Series. So that's why I remember it exactly. But I went dog sledding the next day. I had a blast. We, I don't know how long we were out there. I was talking to moose. I mean, moose were literally watching me do this. It was wild. I don't know that I ever have a chance to do that again. So that's mine. And, and I'm just going to lead right in. Christian, welcome. 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever gone dog sledding. I saw you shaking your head. You're very familiar with uh, probably Homer, Alaska and dog sledding and the Iditarod and all that. But I was just wondering, you know, those dogs have a have a leader uh, and it's probably not the person mushing them. It's that lead dog. You probably have to, to deal with a bunch of lead dogs in your business. So first of all, welcome and tell us what you know about dogs and and or lead dogs. <laughs> well, I thank you. It's great to be here. And um, I've never dog mushed myself or I've never been on a sled. So I, I don't know about that, um, but I'm around it a lot. And one thing I know about dogs, at least from my own dog, is that uh, you can talk about training a dog. You can talk about leading a dog. You can talk about a dog's behavior. But the most effective leaders of dogs are people who manage themselves well and lead themselves well. And so if you're going to have a dog musher who's leading a team, I'm just extrapolating out, not having done it myself. They have to be pretty in charge of themselves and, and the energy that they communicate to their team and the direction that they communicate to their team. And so there can often be a sense in leadership that my team needs to get this right or those things, these other circumstances need to be right. But the main really point about leadership is the leader needs to do internal work. Yeah. Wow. I just have to tell you, we're talking about dog sledding and my husky heard and came in to, to, <laughs> came, to man, you, you can feel that voice, the voice <laughs> called the wild voice of the North. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're getting ready for uh, the Iditarod actually, which is the big dog race. It's about right. 1100 miles Saturday from, from our city. Yeah. So I've grown up watching the start of that race. And uh, this year, my wife who's actually from Nome, Alaska, where the race oh. ends. We're going to, we're going to go spend uh, about a week up there. Um, in about a month and a half watching the sleds come in that's so, cool that'll be exciting for us it'll be different for us so so christian you do a lot of work with people with, with companies who are trying to do succession planning and figure it out yeah and you know we think, I think about succession i think about the tv show you know with all the drama and whatever but i i don't think most companies are you know it's not billionaires with kids fighting over you know who's going to run the empire tell us what succession really looks like from your perspective and, and how companies can be more effective, particularly if they're ordinary companies, not billionaires. Yeah. Secession is can be pretty dramatic. It, it actually is not. I, I haven't seen that show, but it's it's uh, um, statistically uh, about for small businesses about sixty percent or two thirds of secession attempts fail, and it's very high. And when you look at Fortune two hundred companies, about one third of secession attempts fail and so there's there is some drama involved in it and around it there's a lot of anxiety a lot of change a lot of shifting around for you know power and for uh, um, you know who gets what in the in the shifting dynamics and so i haven't seen the tv show i wouldn't say tv is often the most accurate you know <laughs> reflection of reality but i would say it can be pretty dramatic what's most common around secession is people put too little thought into it and they start doing that too late and they often oversimplify um what's involved to make it work well and the things that i find in secession that most people tend to almost fixate on are not the things that actually matter the most and so it's an interesting process of leading an owner or a board through a process of producing or it's if it's a family owned company how do you walk them through that process of of the decision making uh, um in some ways a good comparison of exit or secession is a little bit like trying to talk to your parents about uh, estate planning or long term care planning um it's a conversation that people get weird about and it's and it is more complicated than you want it to be and there's a lot of decisions you have to make without knowing if they're the right answer and so it creates but it feels like there's an enormous amount at stake so there's there's a lot of dynamism in it which is one of the reasons i love the space is because it is very dynamic there's a lot that you're doing in that space it's never predictable um and it has such a big impact on people's lives when when it's done well, and actually when it's done badly as well. But <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a meaningful time for people. 
Yeah, a- absolutely. And and actually, Christian, I had this revelation that goes back to my my dog sled, which has, I think, something to do with succession. So bear with me. I, I remember when the dog sledder asked if I want to stand up behind the dog, she would be behind me and I would be yeah. uh, in front of her and she would be guiding, but I would be up, feel, feel like it was what it was like. And I remember she did warn me. She goes, look, if something happens and I fall off, your only thing is, your only rule is don't let go. <laughs> don't let right. go of that because the dogs will be gone. And so, yeah. and, and just yeah. when you were talking and made me think there is a leader there who needs somebody who's, who's basically that other person not to let go, uh, but they need guidance on, on what to right. do. I don't know if that's a good corollary or not, but in my head, it, it came out. Can you add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think that for any organization or team, that's a healthy one. Um, if you're comparing it to dog sleds, like dog sleds, dog teams, from my observation, um, they're very high energy. When you watch a dog team that's sitting and waiting at the beginning of a race, they're, they're not quietly waiting, rarely. They're usually really, really, like you can visibly see the energy. Yeah. And the minute they can go, they all go quiet. They're usually all working, making a lot of noise, very kind of high energy and the minute they're on task and there's a direction they all go quiet and they're all together on task but that comes about and for them to do that well without veering off and running into problems comes about because there's somebody who's guiding them and controlling the energy so that's a lot of what i think about when i think leadership is how do you guide the energy that's in the people that you're leading as opposed to trying to create it or produce it. And when I find leaders are really struggling with getting a team to move, I usually will believe that or, or explore, are you actually even tapping into where their energy is at? Because it's usually there somewhere. People are typically motivated to do something. And so that's what I see a lot with dog, if that makes sense. That's what I see a lot with dog teams is, is a good um, team leader, a good musher, is guiding the energy, watching for, like with the Iditarod coming up, it's a long race. They, it can take weeks for some people to finish. And so you're watching the energy, you're taking care of the energy of the team over the long haul, you're taking care of them, um, but they're doing a lot of the work. So it, it's interesting because that's, you know, we're talking about succession, but there's also, if you're not necessarily looking for a someone to succeed you, a successor, you're also looking at how you get the most value from your business. One of the things that small business yeah. owners might be looking at is how do I prepare my business to sell it, right? Yeah. So it's similar type of things. Can you talk a little bit about, because I think also people don't think about that till it's too late sometimes. So frequently, they yeah. Or they, they oversimplify what it'll take. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, this is maybe a little semantical, but um, secession is often what it's a process for exchanging leaders and then exits usually the term that's used if you're selling a company and and it it helps because there's a lot of similarities but key differences and um one of the key differences with an exit is i think a lot of people approach it kind of like they want to sell their house so i'm going to put my house up on the market now it ought to sell in a month things go bad it'll take two or three months to sell that's kind of a very common perspective and they often don't understand at all what uh, what makes a business attractive to buyers or because they know it's attractive to them. It's their baby. They've built it. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful baby. And uh, they have a hard time understanding that not everyone else may think their baby is beautiful. Or the other thing, kind of to oversimplify it a little bit, but the buyer is rarely the actual buyer. There's usually a banker or a lender behind them who's not romantically involved with this business at all, could care less, and is making sure that it's a good investment for their bank. And so they're looking at it very differently. They don't, sellers often don't understand that they need to speak to, they need to be prepared to speak to this other entity that's actually giving them the money. If that makes sense. So they usually wait till too late to do that, which makes it harder. So I want to slide this question in before we take our first break. I'm always interested, Christian, on how people got to where they are today. Uh, at some yeah. point, something within you, you were given an opportunity or you thought about, hey, I'd like to be a leadership consultant. I'd like to help people yeah. with exits and and succession and and other, other things related to that. Uh, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I came into it sideways. I um, 
part of my early career, I was involved in international disaster relief and development. So I was working in war zones and in conflict zones and disaster zones. And uh, um, I started to see that regardless of how well-funded or how secure the environment we were working in was, that whether or not a project succeeded had more to do with the quality of leadership and the health of the team than anything else. I've been in hot conflict zones or active disaster areas where there were no resources, nobody wanted to fund, and we could get an enormous amount done if we had great leadership and a solid team. Additionally, I would see this reflected in a community when a community had really good leadership and, and a, you know, a council or elders or, a, you know, whatever the governance was in the area worked together well, they could accomplish a lot. And uh, so I just became really passionate about the topic that was, you know, 20 some years ago and started pursuing it. So that's the, the short version of how I started getting into it. At all around the same time, I started being asked to sit in on meetings with people. And I couldn't understand why, but I thought, all right, you know, it sounds interesting. So I would just go sit in on the meeting. Finally, I asked people, like, why do you want me in these meetings? I don't have anything to do with it. I don't even necessarily understand what you're doing there or what you're talking about in the meetings. Um, but they just said the meetings make more sense when you're there because you ask questions. Just in, in my attempt to understand what's this meeting about and why am I here, I was helping everyone else understand the same thing <laughs> on accident. And then you know, eventually I realized I can make a living out of uh, being the dummy in the room and asking questions. I, I by the way, I love that. Uh, I, I think a lot of us who are in entrepreneurial, especially consulting, figure out that uh, it's the dumb questions that we ask that make us so make us so valuable because yeah. nobody else is asking them. So right. let's listen, Christian. We're, we've come across our first short break, and so we're going to take that break to hear Great. from today's spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest, Christian Muntean, for a hot or not section of the show, uh, I think I have any, a layup for him. But we're going to be talking about writing books. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. Does this sound like you? I'd love to write a book but I just don't have the time. In fact, I'm not sure where to even start. Maybe you have a compelling story to share or valuable advice for clients and prospects. If only you could get that story out of your head and into a published format. Think you don't have the time to write a book? Think you aren't a good enough writer to get your message across? Think this all sounds overwhelming? Think again. At Leverage to Market Associates, we help aspiring authors transform that long-stuck book idea into an attractive published work. If you've written most of your book, we can help you edit it and drive through the production process. If you're not sure where to start, we'll coach you through the creative process to organize your thoughts and create a compelling book outline. And if you're just not comfortable writing it yourself, we can ghostwrite for you. Contact Leverage to Market Associates for a complimentary evaluation of your nonfiction book concept today and bring your book to life. Okay. Well, thank you. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. And today we're beyond and up north. Uh, I'm Linda Poppy, and our guest today is Christian Muntean. And our next segment is Hot or Not. So I don't know if it's hot or not in Anchorage right now. I'm guessing it's probably closer to the not, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, Christian, this is where Linda and I pepper you with questions about business, about leadership, about life, about uh, who knows what else. Uh, and then you're going to okay. tell us whether the topic or concept is hot and why or why not. So I'm going to ease you in. I'm going to give okay. you, I, I think, an easy one. Hot mm -hmm. or not, Christian, writing books. I think it's hot for some people. Okay. Is it hot for you? It is. Yeah. I have two books working on a third. Yeah. So let's, I'd love to have you. So people who are watching or listening uh, understand how they can pick up the books and what the books are going to help them with. Yeah. Well, my first two books, the uh, first one was called Conflict and Leadership. And that came straight out of my background in disaster relief, where um, I saw that there's a lot of conflict on teams. And that's, typical in all kinds of organizations. So uh, one of the things I was looking at is what leaders can do differently within their organizations and what seems to be the missing piece of information that most other books on conflict don't address, which has to do with systems and cultures within organizations. Uh, 
And so that's what I'm addressing in that book. And so that's available. All my books are available pretty much. They're, they're ubiquitous, as you guys say. <laughs> they're, uh, they're available wherever Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, wherever, wherever you're buying books. Um, the other book is called The Successful New CEO. And I wanted to write a book for people that were entering into a CEO position or any kind of executive position for the first time. It's different than what most people think. And that's what most people don't believe until they're there. Then they realize, oh, I didn't expect these things. And so this walks people through how to be successful in that role. That's great. Fantastic. So you've mentioned the, um, the war zones and whatever. So hot or not, yeah. um, spending time living in, um, in areas that are perhaps undergoing turmoil and change. Is that something you recommend for other people? Oh. Obviously, you do early in your career. Yeah. Y yes, I guess that's a qualified yes. I, I think it's very important. I think it's been very helpful for me to have uh, to give me a very different perspective than I think what most people carry. And in the United States, many people just don't have an appreciation for how different it can be elsewhere, both good or bad, um, but particularly places that are in war or disaster or have chronic poverty or chronic issues. I think when you it helps you honestly it just helps you realize how special it is here and how unique it is here. And it helps me that with all of the stuff we fuss about, it helps me be grateful for what we have and also try to understand how do I, you know, continue to contribute and serve from out of what I have. Christian, I work with a lot of small and medium sized businesses and most probably would be more classified as small businesses or family businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think a constant refrain. I don't know if that's the right word, but a constant refrain is um, they're not exactly sure what succession looks like, how it should look yeah. like. Family members, are they going to have children yeah. who take over? Are they going to have employees who take over? And and yeah. they and 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 you know we talk about when to get started. So hot or not, getting started super, on super super red hot. Super like, red getting hot. started early. Yeah. Planning planning <laughs> early. Getting started early. That part's not so hot. But the topic is super hot. Okay. So about 60% of businesses in America right now are owned by baby boomers. So people that are in their late 50s to okay. late 70s. And the vast majority of those owners are in the back of their mind. They're recognizing I'm either past due for retirement or I'm ready to retire. And so they're saying, I want to be out within the next year or two. That's, that's, the, that's what the statistics say. And they do not have a plan. The vast majority don't have a plan. And, and this is the part that they don't know, so hopefully we can turn up the heat for any listeners that are in this space, only about, for small businesses, only about 20% of them will successfully exit their business if they don't plan and put it together, kind of think through how they want to do that well. They can turn that statistic around, but the success rate for an exit or for a healthy succession is very low. So I have a couple quick, a couple quick follow-ups on that. Number one is I, I want to verify because I said starting early because I, 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 my thought was that there's a right time to at least start the process, and it should maybe yeah. be before it's a year or two to go. Maybe, maybe you're, right. you know, maybe you have ten years to go. Should you start the pro? When's the right time? I guess is the question. And yeah. then, could you define? Because I find this interesting. Could you define? When you say a successful, only 20% successfully, how do you define that? What, what does that mean? Yeah. So, well, in terms of, let me answer the first question. The right time is now. You know, it's that, that old proverb was, when's the right time to plant a tree? And it was 20 years ago. When's the second best time? Right now. And, and uh, I can elaborate on that a little bit more, but the, really the reality is, is I work with quite a few owners that know they aren't going to retire right now. I was just working with one uh, yesterday. He's thinking 15 years out from now. Now is the right time for him to be working on it because he'll be able to build a very strong business that allows him maximal freedom for whatever he wants to do, whether he wants to exit it or he just doesn't want to be very active involved in the day-to-day. -day. And so um, and it's the same kind of work that you need to do either way. Um, the, what the other question was the right, what, yeah, uh, defining, defining, uh, successful success. Exit, yes. Yeah. So a successful exit 
for most, this is as defined by them. Do you feel like this was a good choice for you? Did this work the way you wanted it to? That's typically the way it's defined. Most people will define a successful exit um, as did they get the, the money, usually that they were the terms that they wanted out of it. And did life look like what they wanted afterwards? And that's another kind of different topic, but many uh, owners are not really prepared for life afterwards. They realize, oh, I'm not going to die right away. I've got another 30 years of kicking around. What am I going to do? And it turns out I can't golf 80 hours a week and my spouse doesn't want me in the house and they haven't thought about it. And that, it, so thinking through that becomes a big, big deal. Um, the For secession, oftentimes su successful secession is defined by the board, whoever is hiring the incoming CEO. And they say most of the time, uh, only about 30 some, 33% of the time, do they feel like we brought in the right person and that worked well. And that's based off of all kinds of things, per performance of the company, how long they got along with people relationally um, and any of those kinds of things. Wow, lots of stuff there to start thinking about. So um, I, I, going back to what you said about people kind of getting out of their business and then saying, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Yeah. How hot or not doing that kind of planning early to say, here's what I need to get into. Um, and here's what I need to get out of what, I, what I've got. Yeah. By hot, do you mean like hot for the, the person, at the, the owner? Yeah. They're not thinking about it. Mm. It's cold and it's, it's a problem. And actually what happens, and, uh, um, you know, Marshall Goldsmith wrote a book, a little book about this. It's just called secession, and I recommend it to people, and it doesn't describe the secession process, but it describes this dynamic that um, what happens, and I've seen this, I would say this happens 70, 80% of the time, that an exiting or leader that's looking at secession, if they don't have a good sense, if there's nothing pulling them that they want to go to, they will subconsciously sabotage their exit or their secession. Like it happens predictably. They'll walk into it and right as the deal's about to be made or as they're about to bring in their heir apparent or whatever's gonna happen, they'll blow it up or they'll find ways to wreck things or they'll they'll dig in their heels and slow down. And it, it really can be damaging. And it's unfortunate because you'll see people who are very respected. They've built fantastic organizations and they fumble the exit or the secession or the handover, and it kind of leaves sort of this awkward, bittersweet, but more bitter flavor to their legacy, which is completely avoidable. Um, but it, it, and it's often due to this dynamic of not really having something to go to. It's like this undercurrent of, of, uh, of meaning and identity and purpose that they're not, they're not aware is there. And it, it manifests in a significant way right around that secession or exit dynamic. So another hot or not for you, hot or not, Christian, a formal and funded by sell agreement. Well, it's hot for people like you and me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, so it I is. I, I would say you, you're you're correct in that. But let's just say, you know, for yeah, small yeah. business owners, um, Small might business be owners, and most owners, unfortunately, probably don't fully understand what you just said. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yes, right. that, that might be the problem right there, right? That's part of the problem. Most buy-sell agreements, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's usually a formal document in an organization that has a partnership, an LLC or something like that. And it explains how will the company be bought or sold or shares be bought or sold. Most of those are boilerplate documents that are not very effective. And, and and so on their own, most buy sell agreements are poorly written and poorly thought through, or they haven't been updated to meet the actual current needs of the organization. And in terms of them being funded, I have rarely seen a funded uh, buy sell agreement. And what that what that means for for listeners is, let's say you've got a just a, an amazing management team, and you want to sell it to your management team and your business. You've done a fantastic job. Your business, you should be able to sell it for twenty million dollars. But you've got a management team where they're on average making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and uh, or or more. But they're not in a position to 
buy a $20 million company, even shared amongst two or three of them. And so part of it is how do you set up mechanisms in place where that can be funded and where that can be set up? And uh, I'm and honestly, not many, Dan, I love the fact that you asked that question because not many advisors even know how to answer that question. And so it's a, it's huge and it dramatically expands the options for family owned companies. If, a, if mom or pop want to sell and uh, um, they want to sell to the kids, but they want to get the money now. Um, if it's not funded and thought through, it's not going to happen. And that can create to a lot of awkward Thanksgivings down the road. Yeah. And Linda, I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to sabotage you. I got one quick uh, note before we head to break. So my apologies to Linda. You know, the other way that things I, I, I use the term funded is is life insurance. So if you have partners right. and all of a sudden um, one one partner dies, you have two other partners yeah. and that partner spouse comes and says the dead, the, 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 the deceased partner's spouse says, hey, I want my share and you haven't funded that with life insurance. You got to pull it out of petty cash. That ain't so good right. either, is it? Yeah, no, in life insurance, it, I'm not the life insurance uh, uh, that this is your space, but the uh, it is one of the, uh, if it's well thought through and a well-designed tool, um, it can be, it's, it's important for people to think about it and to consider how those kinds of insurances can impact that. Um, it, it is not uncommon to see companies that haven't thought through these things. And, and unfortunately, it's not uncommon, you know, life insurance, uh, people selling life insurance like to scare people with, you could die. Um, unfortunately, I see it. I see people getting cancer. I see people having sudden heart attacks and dying. I've, I've seen a lot of that. And it can really leave the business in the mind. Well, kind of as I, a quick follow up to that, um, at, you know, beyond just that, it's even like like people owners should think about kind of like creating an estate plan for their business. Mm -hmm. I've seen businesses that one, you know, the owner was the only one who had signing privileges. And so when they died, there was no way the spouse could get anything other than the problem of watching the company go through probate. How do you even make payroll when nobody can sign? It takes time to sort that stuff out. And it's important to think those through and that in advance. And some of that can be and should be funded. So you can bring in a yep. team to get that done. So your spouse who never really cared that much about how the business operated isn't trying to figure it out now. It's part of our problem of thinking sometimes I think we're immortal. So uh, Linda, yeah. <laughs> Linda, sorry for choking you out there. Uh, we're going to take a short, we're going to take a short break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back with our guest, Christian Munting for our plead the fifth section of the show, I'm going to ask Christian about getting choked out. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the shrimp tank. And Plead the Fifth is brought to you by our wonderful corporate sponsors, Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial, First Underwriters Insurance, BC Fitness Studio, and Upstart Group. Please visit our website, www.shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Now back to the show. Okay. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank, where we interview the best and the brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area. And beyond, we're a little north today to Alaska. I'm co-host Linda Popke. Our guest today is Christian Munty. And our next segment is Plead the Fifth. So we're turning up the heat a little, Christian. We're going we're gonna to throw some fastballs at you here, maybe a curveball or so. We're going to ask you some more questions. And, and if you don't want to answer one, you can plead the fifth. But you only get to plead the fifth once. And then, boy, we really oh. turn up the heat. So I know I have a friend. I've never done this. I have a friend who's into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I saw that on your bio. And he talked yeah. about, you know, the first time that he he had to get choked out, um, which is basically getting put to sleep, as I believe what it is. And yeah. you see it. So I'm going to ask you, plead the fifth. Tell us about uh, getting choked out and if you were scared out of your mind. I don't know. I've never been choked out. Oh, you've I not been choked out. out. No. Oh. <laughs> have you choked somebody Can't out? Tell you. I have choked other people out. Yes. So you it's, were probably it's actually scary when you choke somebody out I, for me. I, I didn't expect them to go out that I've done it three times and I didn't know they were going to go out any of those times. And so it's a little, uh, it's surprising. And I mean, they get over it and they come back, but for a while you're, you know, afraid you might've killed them. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> I don't think I want to meet you in a dark alley. <laughs> yeah. No, don't, okay. don't jump on me. It'll be, it'll no, be easier. That would not be good. That would not be good. Okay. Yeah. So I want to ask you, because you've got hobbies, you've got a lot of different things you do. Yeah. You know, in terms of you've been a personal trainer, you do the jujitsu, you do all these other things. If you were going to start a business with one of your hobbies, what would it be? I... I I actually used to be a strength and conditioning instructor part time, and I got into it because I was just at a gym working out. You know, this is my job, but I was doing that, and it actually became like a little side business. Um, people, I took over a class that I was attending, and, and just I taught for twelve years. And um, I love the fitness world, the athletic world. And it would be fun for me to own a gym and um, to be a trainer, but I love that environment. I love that community. And so that's probably, if I were to make a hobby out of something uh, like a hobby business, that's probably where I would go. So Linda, because I had choked you up before, I'm going to let you go <laughs> back to back. Do you have another plead the fifth for uh, Absolutely. This okay. is one of my favorite questions. If you could have dinner with anybody dead oh. or alive, who would it be? You can have a couple of people yeah. and what would you ask them about? Yeah, well, man, the first, this is going to, the first thing that came to mind is I love to have dinner with my wife without my kids to make that be easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing. Okay. And I'd just be happy to, to just let her talk. But the uh, um, that was the first thing that, that came to mind. Yeah, um, man, if I could just talk to anybody. That's kind of a tough question for me to answer, honestly. There's so many people I get interested in. You know, I think any, I get interested. So here's what I get interested. One of the things I get interested in is I, I started reading a lot of history books. I got really interested in, you know, the founding of this country and the leadership behind that and how diverse they were and how much they argued and fought with each other. And we think, you know, it's bad now. It was bad then when they would have duels with each other and fights in Congress and so on. And so I think any of the founding fathers mm -hmm. or or people that were involved in that, I just think it would be interesting to get kind of an up-to-date perspective on how they thought and how they managed that, especially the disagreements. I think that to me would be fascinating because they they somehow, uh, with all everything we think we know now, back then they somehow built something that's worked for a long time and i think that's pretty fascinating i'd be interested in talking to to anybody from back then that was in that position cool well I, i'm a history buff i i was a history major in college i i'm right there okay. with you i i uh, i have i'm fascinated by that time period i'm gonna make you jump in the delorean though christian right. we're gonna send you back yeah. however many years takes you back to 18 years old and without messing up the time continuum uh you had a chance yeah. to talk to yourself for five minutes what advice would you give an 18 year old christian wow um I don't know if 18 year old christian would understand the advice but <laughs> the uh um <laughs> I think, I think I, I think like a lot of 18 year olds, but then even a lot of, you know, 48 year olds where I'm at now, um, I think a lot of people don't understand. I think it's a bigger deal than what I appreciated the idea of self-image mm -hmm. and being confident in yourself. And there's a lot to that. It's hard to just like communicate it, but I think that there was a lot of, uh, energy spent and time spent in uh, uh, fighting things or protecting against things that didn't matter. And it was more about how I saw myself. And so I think, um, yeah, I don't know, going back and communicate, I don't, maybe it's just kind of affirming myself from back then. But um, I think that, that that's something that I didn't understand then. And okay, here's what it is. It's coming to my, as I'm talking about it, I think it's <laughs> for me, I've wrestled with perfectionism for much of my life. And I think that being able to try to talk to myself at 18 and, and uh, saying it doesn't matter as much as I thought it did, that other things matter more. And uh, um, that I think that would have uh, saved me a lot. I love that. Love it. Okay. One more question. Have you ever turned away a potential client 
and why? And if you didn't, is there someone you work with that you wish you would have turned away? That I work with now? Oh, in, in the past. <laughs> you know, not now, but in yeah, the past. I know all my current clients to be, huh, does that mean? Um, <laughs> I have deflected clients. I'll put it that way. I've never told somebody, no, I'm not going to work with you. Um, at least not that I recall, but I've deflected it in the sense of the conversation somehow never gets to a proposal. And uh, um, uh, so, yes, there are clients in the past and there's a number of uh, people who are interested in working with me that are being deflected <laughs> now. What what makes you decide to deflect someone? Like, what is it? Is it a, a just a feeling of not a good fit? Yeah. And so a couple of things I look for, it's important to me that people really care about other people. So it's important that they care about their employees, that they care about their customers. So if I, if I get a sense that they don't, um, then I'm not interested in helping them succeed. I mean, that's kind of a, a bottom line thing for me. If I feel like someone is, is, uh, um, particularly if they're coming into an initial conversation and there's a, a clear lack of ethics or concern around ethical behavior, uh, not only will the project not be successful, it just won't be. Um, they're just not also not someone that I'm interested in working with. The other part of it is uh, when I find that uh, prospective clients aren't willing to work, that's probably one of the biggest things that that will put me off, is, aside from what I just said, is I'm, I can't be a magic wand. I can't. It's like when I was a strength and conditioning coach. Um, I could give people a routine. I could give them a regimen that absolutely would be tailor made and would work for them, but I could never do the work for them. And any effort I did do was taking away from their need to actually put in the effort themselves. And that's that's probably one of the other big, big reasons, particularly with people who might want to return to me as a client, that I'll kind of deflect that is I can just. I just have learned they're not willing to work. And so I don't think it's right to uh, take them on as a client. All right. Well, you're doing the work here and we're glad to have you here. So we want to thank you for being the guest here with us on the Shrimp Tank today. Yeah, so for great. listeners who want to get in touch with you and learn more about your company, where should they go? Yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me or to learn more about what I do is to go to uh, www.christianmuntine.com. All right. Fantastic. And for everyone, once you've done that, make sure you also go and check out all of our replays on shrimptankpodcast.com slash Seattle and wherever you get your podcasts, such as iHeart, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, because damn, we are. We are, of course, ubiquitous. We are. And when you do that, follow us on the show's uh, social media pages on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Well, Christian, you know what? It's been a long time since we've chatted. Uh, I'm glad that we've had this opportunity and hopefully it won't be so long again. Thanks for being on the show. I really, really enjoyed it. Linda, as always, thank you. I feel like we had this whole progression uh, going from Anchorage straight down to Seattle all the way down to the Bay Area. So that's kind of cool. Thank you. Everybody do what Linda said. Like us on Facebook because that way you can live stream us every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific. Our next show will be Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, you'll be recuperating from Valentine's Day. So pull up a chair and listen to Dr. Tom Lamar from Anchor Chiropractic. He's my chiropractor. He's been on the show before. Our guest is a special guest, Lee Heisman. Our guest host, I should say, is a special guest. Lee Heisman is the founder of the Shrimp Tank Podcast. He's filling in for a week and he's going to join me uh, in interviewing Dr. Tom Lamar next Wednesday, the 15th. In the meantime, please be safe, be well, be prosperous, because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp.